rich with life, full of beauty, history, and lore. These are the coasts of America. In the rush to inhabit these shores, the resource has been misunderstood. What once seemed so vast and mighty has fallen victim to increasing demands. Now Americans are learning that the coasts are not as forgiving as they once thought, that they need help. In Stump Sound, North Carolina, a seventh generation fisherwoman believes her fishing waters are worth fighting for. There's a stopping point somewhere when this sound says no, when Mother Nature says no, and it starts slapping back in the face and we have reached it. And today she is leading a whole community into action. If it's necessary to go to court, don't be afraid to go. Keep the heat on and get these waters cleaned up. In Port Aransas, Texas, a scientist has a mission. He wants people to know what's coming ashore. When I first came here, I thought that the majority of the stuff was left on the beach by people who come here to visit. But it didn't take a scientific project to also realize that when you find a five-gallon drum of acid matrix mixing agent J47, that that was not left here by somebody who came for a picnic. Over 50 miles from the Chesapeake Bay in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, high school students are spreading a message. People, no matter where they live, no matter if they live in Michigan or California or Kansas, whatever they put onto the ground goes into some river system and then that affects some body of water. And so it's not just us here on the Chesapeake. And it's, it's everyone in the country, everyone in the world. In increasing numbers on each and every shore, individual Americans are accepting the challenge on the coast. They are people who are making a difference. They are conserving America. Conserving America is presented in association with the National Wildlife Federation. Over 95,000 miles of shoreline, estuaries, harbors and bays define America as a maritime nation. From these coasts come billions of dollars in food, energy, and recreation. A bounty shared by all. Americans have long had a love affair with the seashore. From the boardwalk at Atlantic City to Surf City, USA, a day at the beach has long been a part of the American way of life. But so many enjoyed their visit so much that they decided to stay. And in recent years, people have been moving to the coast in record numbers. By the early 1990s, three out of every four Americans will live within 50 miles of a coast. And to the coast, people bring many things, including trash. By land and by sea, it comes from all over the world from cities, commercial ships, pleasure craft, and oil platforms. 14 billion pounds of trash is thrown into the ocean each year. And much of it ends up on the beach. 
perhaps nowhere is the threat greater than in Texas. Converging currents from the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico bring the world's garbage to the Texas shore. The beach here is a good indicator of what's out there. It's such an absurd collection of things. Oceanographer Tony Amos documents what he sees along this seven-mile stretch of beach near Port Aransas, Texas. He's been doing it for over 11 years. And it seems to be primarily composed of um, plastic. That's a major item of trash on the beach right now. Last year, the United States produced over 50 billion pounds of plastics, much of it designed to be thrown away. What was intended to make life easier for people can become a killer for wildlife. Tony Amos knows. I've seen entanglement, especially of marine birds, sometimes with fishing line, other times it's with their heads in six-pack containers. And plastic doesn't go away. A single six-pack ring can last up to 450 years. To many marine animals, plastic products are floating death traps. Plastic is very, very strong, and it cuts into their flesh. And as they grow, if they are able to feed, that plastic will bite in deeper and deeper. I hate to see it. It's, um, I do like to point out that it's not every bird or animal that you see entangled, but I think that even one is, is too many. I um, must have wandered up and down this stretch uh, about 2,000 times now. But I do take it personally. It's, um, it's my beach. Amos was born in England. He came to Port Aransas in 1976 as a research associate with the University of Texas Marine Science Institute. It was his love for animals, particularly oh, birds, that drew him to the beach. Western sandpiper, piping plover. I'm always fascinated by the seasonal change in things, so I like to count my birds around the year and then see how they change from year to year. Uh, Forster's turns and one laughing girl. With a scientist's curiosity, he noted everything. An onboard computer stored and organized the information. And what else did I say? Oh, one milk jug. I also realized that perhaps this uh, garbage on the beach would affect the way the birds were able to survive. So I started making notes about what I saw. I was appalled by what I saw, quite frankly. Spray can. Dichloro, difluoromethane, which um, if I can spell that, and I still am appalled by what I see. It struck me at first that people tended to deny that there was a problem. People either had got so used to seeing this stuff or didn't really want it to be there. You can come down to this beach and you'll see people literally sitting in a garbage dump. They're sitting on the beach, and they're in their bikinis, and they've got their six-packs and their radios, and if they looked around them, there's man's refuse all around. But I think it's very important that people actually see this and realize what we're doing. Almost without knowing it, Tony Amos began what would become the most detailed survey of an American beach ever made. At the Marine Science Institute, he tabulates years of data. For the first time, exact types, quantities, and the origin of debris are being recorded and cataloged. Pam Plotkin helps organize the mountain of material. One critical aspect of Amos's work is to get this information to the public. Tony Amos's work did not go unnoticed. Linda Marinus is the regional director of the Center for Marine Conservation. When I first moved to Texas and I talked to people about the seriousness of marine debris and what it was doing to the wildlife, people would say, have you ever met Tony Amos? Have you heard of Tony Amos? When Linda Marinus met Tony Amos, it was the beginning of a lasting friendship. They shared a common goal, but they knew that the first step in getting rid of the debris was to get people involved. I think there was a lot of frustration in Texas about the conditions of the beaches. 
And people had watched as they grew up, the conditions getting worse and worse, and they didn't really know what to do about it. All that began to change in 1986, when Linda initiated the first Texas beach cleanup, and the people of Texas responded. Now in its fourth year, the beach cleanup happens each fall during a national awareness campaign called Coast Weeks. If one man could be heard around the state of Texas, maybe thousands could be heard all the way to Washington. Linda Marinus thought so. And today, nearly 6,000 volunteers will arrive to help clean up this stretch of beach. Armed with their own data cards, they will cover over 120 miles of beach. A little bit of litter makes a lot of bad beach. It's bad on the eyesight if you cut your feet. It wastes our taxes, treats wildlife mean. So be a beach buddy and keep the beaches clean. Be a beach buddy. Today, less than 1% of all plastic is recycled. But here in Texas, that's about to change. Soon, a coating system will identify those plastics that can be recycled. A new industry is waiting to happen. This day, in just three hours, a staggering 214 tons of garbage will be picked up and documented by the volunteers. For the work to be done by the Center for Marine Conservation, this information is critical. Even I, after all those years of looking at it, it wasn't until I started counting the damn stuff that I realized uh, how much was there. Don't mess with Texas beaches. This is the new report. It came out last week. It's because of your efforts. It's all the data that you've collected for the last four major beach cleanup in Texas. We're really proud to have this ready. We're going to send it to everybody that's in a position to make a decision to get marine debris stopped. It just shows what volunteers can do. The first cleanup, we hope for 1,000 people. We hope we pick up 10 tons of garbage. The fact is, we had 3,500 Astounded by the figures, Texas the Land Commissioner Gary Morrow joined in the campaign. He began even more projects, all under a program called Adopt-A-Beach. Texans are now taking personal charge of their beaches. Suddenly we get 500, 800 phone calls a week. Uh, we've got 142 groups adopting our beaches. Within three months, we had 100% of our beaches adopted. We had over 17,000 volunteers pick up a documented 700 plus tons of garbage. And for the first time, the Texas Shrimp Association joins in the cleanup. Garbage trapped in their nets and usually left at sea is returned to port for proper disposal. Education is an important part of the Texas beach cleanup. And these children are captivated by the tall scientist. I think they really see the, uh, the problems. And when we show how this material, the plastics and so on, has entangled some beautiful animals, birds and turtles. I've seen fish with their heads in there. I think it really gets to them. Not messy and yucky to see, but it's also dangerous to the animals that we all love. Now, almost every kid in Texas knows whales can die from a baggie. And every kid in Texas is learning that a six-pack ring is a death threat to birds. But we've also sort of educated some of the politicians in Washington that this is a really serious problem and that they, through legislation, can do something about it. What Tony Amos began more than a decade ago continues today. In Texas, the idea of cleaning up a beach turned out to be contagious. These children are not likely to forget what happened here today. Oh, I don't know about you. Do you think you're oh, Do you think you're going to remember? Yeah, I think she might remember too. <laughs> All right. Today, 25 states have beach cleanup campaigns, and in Washington, D.C., legislators are beginning to listen. The United States is now one of 39 nations that have signed a treaty to ban the dumping of all plastics into the ocean. It's a beginning, a blueprint for the future. Over a thousand miles to the north and east of Port Aransas lie the barrier islands of North Carolina. 
These historic islands and their marshes contain some of the most fertile and productive shellfish and wildlife habitat found anywhere. People here have been making their living from these waters in much the same way for hundreds of years. Yet today, the small fishing community of Stump Sound is in trouble. Under the broad oaks at Sunset Harbor, a meeting is in progress. Coming out tonight to listen to a everyday country girl shell fisherman. Is it gonna be close to everybody? Is it gonna be a health hazard? You look at these children in here tonight. For years, the fishermen of Stump Sound have been losing the battle for clean water. And no one speaks more from the heart than Lena Ritter. What are they going to have to take their children to when they're this size? No longer can we sit back and say, I can't do nothing. You can't do that anymore. Let me tell you something. We people are just as important as other people. Don't ever let them fool you. Today on every American coast, choices are being made. For the fishermen here in North Carolina, their problems are linked to the boom in coastal development. Topsail Island separates Stump Sound from the sea. Nearby condominiums and housing tracts reach like fingers back to the shellfish beds. The bridges that carry people to these New Island homes pass right over the men and women whose families have worked here for generations. With a simple pair of hinged rakes, Lena Ritter and her husband Graham tong for their oysters in the middle of the sound, just off Bermuda Island. People here have a love for this water that's not known among the general walk of people. It has kept us over the generations and over the years just like a mother supplies food for her child. And that's what this water has done for us. For seven generations, Lena Ritter's family has made its living in Stump Sound. But for the Ritters and others, things are no longer the same. Today, less than one-third of North Carolina's wetlands are in their natural state. Sewage plants are overwhelmed. Runoff from each rain sends thousands of gallons of pesticides, oil, fertilizers, and human waste into the sound. To the fishermen, no one seems to be doing anything about it. I've seen the size of the acreage that's closed increase. I've seen the amount of fish you catch go down. And that's common sense right there to tell you that something is wrong. Years of silence were broken when a plan to develop Bermuda Island was made public. For those who fished the island's waters, 383 condominiums and a marina for 140 boats was a clear threat. Lena Ritter spoke out. And they essentially told us, you don't have any expertise. Well, we were just fishermen. And their attitude is when we come in with our money, roll over, rover, get out of my way. It doesn't work that way. I'm not going to roll over, rover. I'm going to stand and fight. We've run into trouble down on this end of the line. It was the beginning of a confrontation that would last almost five years. The coastal heritage of North Carolina is at stake, and in particular, the coastal heritage of the people that live around here. The strength of the people of Stump Sound is in their roots. Bill Rice is a farmer, a fisherman, and a friend of the Ritters. The roots of the people like Ms. Ritter and my wife and others, I'm a newcomer of just 45 years, but the other people have uh, their graveyards and their roots are here. They have been here for most of them 250 to 300 years. They actually don't know when they came, but it looks like there is a conspiracy that we don't count, that we have no rights here, we have no business being here, we're just in the way of progress. And we don't consider what's coming here as progress. It's not progress. We are, we are not backwards. We are people that knows a natural resource when we see it. 
but it's got to where the resources are all getting gone. The battle for Bermuda Island became a battle for a way of life, and Lena Ritter's will grew stronger with each passing day. Once you hurt one of us, you've hurt all of us. Paige Hensley and J.T. Millis have worked the sound since they were boys. Looks like y'all better be catching oysters instead of sitting out here talking. You're getting old. Little by little, a grassroots coalition would be built. You're coming to the meeting tonight, aren't you, up at the shop, you and your mama? Oh, yes. How about you, Paige? For the first time, the fishermen were standing up to be counted. Todd Miller is the executive director of the North Carolina Coastal Federation. If we try to write up a summary, it's just going to go right over everybody's head. But that's why you're going to have to explain it to them. Feed it to me so I can feed it back to my people. Todd Miller was right. Lena Ritter had to be front and center in the fight. Lena was always there whenever there was a public hearing, a need just to get people writing letters or just about anything. Thank you, sweetheart. You're the reason we're doing it today. Everyone would play a part. Fisherman Ken Siegler. She said, Ken, you need to come and do this. Ken, you need to go do this. You need to show up here. OK, Lena, anything I can do to help. <laughs> they traveled over 100 miles to the state capitol at Raleigh. They met with lawmakers and testified at hearings. J.T. Millis was there. It was 35 of us. When we walked into the meeting, here was going on, everybody just stopped and looked at us. And the teens are teen right fast like. <laughs> Suddenly, everyone was paying attention. Auctions and bake sales raised the money for years of litigation. Remember that day that we had that yard sale and it rained so we had to run and grab the stuff up? <laughs> Occasionally, a cake might go unsold, but 84-year-old Miss Bertie knew what to do. She's JT's mother. Bring them back home. We need them. <laughs> but when the subject is the health of Stump Sound, Miss Bertie turns serious. I just keep beginning to tell you what it does mean to me. And it would hurt, and it would hurt bad if it was took away from us. They had become a determined army. From the neighboring counties of Onslow, Pender, New Hanover, and Carteret, they joined forces. Make the of that picnic table to the end so we'll all be together. What you run in the If you want to raise money in Stump Sound, you have a country pig picking. And pig picking after pig picking, the numbers and the influence of Lena River and her friends grew. And along the way, these people discovered something about themselves. For the first time, they saw a new power in unity. Never again would they be ignored. When you get that many people moving on the road, something's going to move. <laughs> And after five years of grassroots action, of people writing, calling, attending hearings, and pressuring lawmakers, the plan to develop Bermuda Island was at last abandoned. And we won. We never thought for a minute we'd lose, because it was important. Elena was always there. She's been a symbol for uh, just what the individual can accomplish. You know, a lot of people have seen what she's done, and uh, they're learning from it, and they're getting involved as a result. So it's made a tremendous difference all over the state. Today, when the folks in Stump Sound hold a pig picking, politicians clamor to get invited. Lena, I'm glad to be here today. I appreciate I'm you. I'm For Lena Ritter, a battle has been won, but the war goes on. The fight over Bermuda Island is over, but the fight over clean water is not over. It's an ongoing battle, and we're going to be in there just as strong as ever before, making sure that who's responsible for pollution is going to clean up their act, 
and we're going to get this steak cleaned up. Today, Bermuda Island is owned by the state of North Carolina and protected as a natural reserve. Its unspoiled beauty is a testament to the determination of Lena Ritter and the people of Stump Sound. Further north, along North Carolina's outer banks, another struggle demonstrates how complex coastal issues can become. Ironically, some fishermen up in this part of the state are at odds with environmentalists. At the center of the storm lies the Oregon Inlet. Located just south of Nags Head, the Herbert C. Bonner Bridge spans this break in the coast. But here, nature, economics, and technology have long collided over a proposal by the Army Corps of Engineers to build jetties to try to stabilize the shifting sands. Most Americans think of land as permanent, but one of the most dynamic environments on the face of the earth is a beach. builds and disappears in relation to the forces around it. But when all is calm, nature's great demonstration is soon forgotten. Yet the coast is always in motion. Waves continuously move sand from one area to replenish another. But human beings seem programmed to fight nature head on. A maze of jetties, groins, seawalls, and other structures are all attempts to protect our investments from the sea. By setting up permanent residence on a moving coast, we've altered natural forces. On eroding shorelines, beaches in front of seawalls are disappearing. Jetties now block the flow of sand and starve adjacent beaches. The system is out of balance, and today many believe that sacrificing public beaches to protect coastal structures is wrong. Here in North Carolina, no one has been more vocal than Duke University geologist Oren Pilkey. There's no compelling societal reason for us to build buildings very close to an eroding shoreline on an open ocean uh, barrier island. None whatsoever. As long as we let the beach roll back naturally and hear it rolling back a foot or two or three a year, the beach has no problem. The beach is not having a problem. Only people are having a problem. For years, Oren Pilkey has studied the proposed jetty project for the Oregon Inlet. The plan calls for solid structures to jet into the sea. Their purpose is to allow the inlet to be deepened and cleared by blocking the natural migration of sand along the coast. An appealing prospect for the fishermen who depend on clear passage to make their living. Time, money, and occasionally even lives have been lost getting in and out of the inlet. Storms are sudden and severe. Greg, you can go ahead. Take Fisherman Moon Tiller knows from experience. And like in the wintertime, you go out there and work, you don't have but sometimes 24 hours, 36 hours to work before the weather gets bad, like this storm coming. Well, you can't stay that night because you're scared that storm's going to come during the night and you can't get in. And that's why when you're close by like this, when it starts to get like that, you, you run right in. And it can be terrible. Pleasurecraft Linda Gay, Pleasurecraft Linda K. This is Coast Guard Station at Oregon Inlet, Channel 12. Over. We're doing quite well. Uh, we're still holding anchor. Uh, not watching. Uh, everything's all right. The outer banks of North Carolina. The graveyard of the Atlantic. Here, pirates once hung lanterns around the necks of horses and walked them up and down the beach. Passing vessels would mistake them for the lights of other ships and be lured in where they'd run aground. Easy pickings for the pirates. The town of Nags Head is named for this deceit. 
Oregon Inlet was blown open by a storm in 1846. Since then, it has migrated nearly two miles south. Today, with a bridge in place, the inlet must remain in place too, and dredges are used to keep the channel open. But with so many storms, boats still get stranded. Where the jetties are, you can go and be on the fishing ground when you see the weather falling, and be so you can get out. And everywhere that they've had this problem, everywhere up and down the coast, all over the world, that's what they come up with, the jetties, and it's all the problem. But to geologist Oren Pilkey, the jetty project ignores all that has been learned. The jetty solution flies in the face of so much experience on the East Coast. We have so much experience with jetties, and jetties always cause erosion problems on, on East Coast barrier islands, without, without exception. Oren Pilkey and others maintain that by blocking the flow of sand along the coast, the jetties could destroy beaches for many miles. With a national wildlife refuge and the Cape Hatteras National Seashore in its path, the local problem became a national concern, and a chorus of groups, including the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Wildlife Federation, and the National Park Service, joined in opposing the project. The strong opposition stalled the proposal for nearly 20 years, and eventually the Department of Interior denied the necessary permits. While many fishermen gave up or moved on, Moon Tillet and a core of others still stand firm. We're not going to give up the battle anyway. I go as far as to say I am going to stay here until I go. I made my mind up for that. If you look at this sand, uh, Oren Pilkey has stood his ground too. Which means it came from the beach. As a geologist, teacher, and author of numerous books on the moving coast, he has been called the single most influential voice on the changing face of America's coastlines. Orrin Pilkey's influence in North Carolina is widespread, and the fishermen know it. After years of frustration, they agree to meet with him one-on-one. -on -one. That inlet will contribute $30 million to this jetty. Yes, sir. There's more footage, more exits going off the north side. In the small back room of a local food and hardware store, the men confront each other. The former chairman of the Oregon Inlet and Waterways Commission, Orman Mann, and retired merchant marine Luther Daniels join Moon Tillett to present their side of the story. Just north of the Esker. Moon's here and been a commercial fisherman all his life. He's sport fishing and commercial fishing. His father was, my father was, my grandfather was. And this aspect of it, you know, that is, is breaking up an industry of the Outer Banks that were here. This disruption of family lives and the loss of Moon's ability to do the only thing he knows to do, I think exceeds the, the cost, you know, when you get into but it. But when you talk about the economy, there ain't no way that we can't pay it back. That sound produces in shrimp alone over $13 million to the fishermen. Well, if you throw in the environmental damage potential of this... We don't get the inlet. We don't have the inlet, we won't have shrimp. And, and what we're seeing, I think... What we're None of them has changed their position, but as the meeting goes on, they've come to understand each other's needs just a little better. Well, there is an alternative to the jetties, and that, and that is dredging. That is increased dredging. Rather than one individual make that decision, I think the general public should be put before the public, and I don't think that a few scientists should make the decision for this. I agree also it shouldn't be up to you, it shouldn't be up to me. It, uh, we're just one out of millions. The question of jetties for Oregon Inlet is yet to be resolved, but along a small stretch of North Carolina beach, a dialogue has begun. I really even hope that maybe we'll get us come up with a solution. Maybe we can come come together and, and uh, have a meeting of the minds and actually come go to the Corps of Engineers together and say, look, we've got to do something about it. Here are some possibilities. Let's look into these things. I'd really like to have that happen. Uh, for sure. I don't know if it will. But... As more and more people compete for this limited coastal resource, balancing economic development with the protection of the natural environment may well be the greatest conservation challenge Americans face in the coming years.
The assault on America's coastlines neither begins nor ends at the ocean's door. The Chesapeake Bay, America's greatest estuary. With over 8,000 miles of shoreline, it is a mecca for sailors and a catch basin for pollutants. In the late 19th century, thousands of wind-powered vessels like this skipjack would harvest up to 15 million bushels of oysters per year. Now, the oyster harvests, like the skipjack fleet itself, have dwindled. Captain Ed Farley's skipjack is the Stanley Norman, and today it is a floating classroom for the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. But these are no ordinary students. They are the Chesapeake Bay kids from Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, led by their biology teacher, Shirley Cavalier. The other organisms. Every piece of mail I was getting across my desk said, Chesapeake Bay, Chesapeake Bay, and the Chesapeake Bay is in trouble. And we've all got to do something about it. And she brought her students here for a first-hand look. From Gettysburg, can you point that out on the blue? <laughs> right there now. <laughs> Janet Papermeister is a field instructor with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Let's do a comparison here of what's happening within the watershed with regard to population. In the year 2020, there'll be really a megalopolis effect here with millions of people coming into the watershed, about 2.6 million. They estimate. These Gettysburg students know that the bay will not only be affected by the millions who will live on its shores. Over 75% of all marine pollution comes from the land and fully one half of the bay's fresh water comes from the Susquehanna River, which flows through some of the richest farmland in America. But what's good for these Pennsylvania farms is bad for the bay. The small community of Gettysburg is over 50 miles from the Chesapeake Bay, and where Civil War soldiers once marched, a new army is afoot. Back from their trip, Shirley Cavalier students continue to learn about the relationship between their home waters here in Adams County and the health of the Chesapeake. Listen up, you guys. So let's do oxygen, carbon dioxide. Let's do pH, alkalinity. We'll do some free acidity. Every bit of water in Adams County ultimately ends up in the Chesapeake Bay. And so our Chesapeake students have begun to learn that their own cleanup begins right here in Adams County. People may be polluting thousands of miles away and not even knowing it. No matter where you live, there's always going to be some kind of water system around you, and that's going to affect another river or another creek, which is going to affect some larger body of water. Here they analyze the stream for its chemical content. High levels of nitrogen and phosphorus would indicate fertilizer runoff from nearby fields. These nutrients find their way into the Susquehanna River and the Chesapeake Bay, causing algae blooms which block sunlight, consume oxygen, and kill fish, oysters, and crabs. But here in Adams County, there are farmers working to prevent such pollution. Here, this is part of our dairy herd. We have approximately 155 milk cows. John Hess is one of a handful of farmers who have adopted conservation practices to help the bay. It reduces your... Shirley Cavalier and the Bay Kids are here to find out more. A milking cow produces over 100 pounds of waste in a single day, and there are nearly 10,000 milking cows in Adams County alone. The enormity of the problem is clear. John Hess shows the students his new manure storage system. Designed to minimize seepage and preserve nutrients, it allows him to manage this natural fertilizer more efficiently. By using this system in conjunction with its terraced fields, John Hess is not only helping to save the bay, he is saving money. The terrace breaks the slope of the field, the length of the slope of the field. Fran Koch is the former district manager of the Adams County Conservation District. She joins the group at the farm. The students spread out to demonstrate just how a terraced field works. By dividing the slope into a gentle grade, the water stays longer and pollution is reduced. For these students, it's all beginning to come together. Shirley Cavalier. 
I want them to be moved to action. I want them to actually get that word out to everyone in Adams County that they can speak to. It's especially important for adults because the teachers in the school can teach the kids, but no one gets the adults. The adults don't get the message. Hi. Hello, girls. Hello. I'm Mary. And that message is not just for farmers. It's for homeowners and businesses. Everyone can help clean up the bay. Different information, and this wheel here tells us about the disposal of cleaning solutions and how to properly dispose of them. And we notice that a lot of them have to be disposed of at hazardous waste dump sites. When I see them presenting a program in front of adults, and then afterwards I say, well, how do you think it went? And they'll say, they really listened to us. And you know, someone came up and they asked me a question and I knew the answer to it. And so they, they really get excited with that. And I like seeing that confidence being built in them. We're from the Chesapeake Bay group at the high school and we're concerned about the phosphorus content and the detergents. Did you buy detergent this afternoon? Yes. The Bay Kids show people that by simply taking the time to read a label, anyone can help improve water quality. First one here is probably the best. Mrs. Cavalier really opened my eyes to the problems of the Chesapeake. And then in turn, I'm going to educate people so they can tell their friends and it'll be passed on. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you. Thank you. The Chesapeake Bay students have a message to carry to all of Adams County and all of the East Coast, all of Pennsylvania. And then as far as we can spread our message. Camp Nawakwa is a few miles outside of Gettysburg. On this cool spring evening, Shirley Cavalier students demonstrate what can be done at home to restore and protect coastal waters. This is Missy, and we'd like to talk to you about household products you may use in your homes or garages or bathrooms. They really don't think about how close they are to the Chesapeake, you know, that nothing they do here is going to ever affect the water or the land on there. When you tell them, they're just shocked. It's original container, and if you can, we'd like you to recycle it. So if the students are bringing to them knowledge about how to dispose of their household waste, I really know that they're going to be some of those homeowners that will take on that same responsibility. Come up here. Take this paint out here and spread it on this newspaper, okay? What you want to do is get this paint to dry. Because if it's in a solid form, like when it's dry, if you just get one person to change the ways of, you know, handling their water, it's going to make a difference, and that's enough for me if it's just one person or if it's 20 people. The oil from one engine of a car, which is about four to six quarts, can make an eight-acre oil slick. See how it goes down the bottom, but it floats back up to the top, and it just sits there. It doesn't do anything, and it sticks. It doesn't come off, so you can't wash it off. It stays on there. To avoid accidents like this, like in just streams and waterways, in Pennsylvania, it is illegal to dispose of oil in any other way than to recycle it. As you can see now, I'm pouring kitty litter into this can, okay? Now, tonight, I'm going to show you how to dispose of things like bug spray. I gave a presentation at the state science convention, and it was to teachers, and I was very nervous because I thought, you know, no way they're going to listen to us. And I was really surprised at the reaction we got from them. They were, okay. they were so attentive and they um, wanted to know more. And I've, I've now come to realize that we're not just a bunch of kids. We really can make a difference. You know, my grandfather and my father would say to me when I was younger, they'd say, you know, oh, look out there. I remember when this was all farmland, you know, as far as the eye can see. Or my dad would say, this was a, you know, a great place to hunt. It's a great place for wildlife until they put that housing development in there. So the Chesapeake Bay is important to me because when I grow up and I get older, I don't want to have to go. You know, the Chesapeake Bay, oh, I can remember when people used to fish there. Or I can remember when, you know, it used to be a great place to go down and take a boat ride or something. We all live downstream, as the slogan says. Because of Shirley Cavalier and her students, and the efforts of many others, including the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, this great natural resource just might be saved. With all that people can do, the protection of coastal waters becomes a matter of life and death for those who can't speak or act on their own. Today, along America's coasts, marine mammals compete with humans for air, food, and water. And many fall ill from pollutants or succumb to man's mistakes. 
The Marine Mammal Protection Act and other laws have helped some populations to rebound. But still, they need people and understanding to survive in their troubled world. California Marine Mammal Center. In Sausalito, California, a group of volunteers and professionals work on their behalf. Okay, I need to take some information from you. Uh... They are members of the California Marine Mammal Center. Hang on, hold still. When an animal is reported sick or injured, they're called into action. This sick sea lion may not realize his good fortune. Within hours, he will be admitted and treated at the center's hospital, high above the Pacific, across from San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge. The newest patient, like all that come here, is given a name. What's his name? Who's going to come Arizona. Arizona, huh? Ooh. Hi, kid. How are you doing, Arizona? Arizona joins the likes of William Randolph, Satchmo, and a blind elephant seal named Annie, who must be coaxed into the water she cannot see. Oh, Annie. Um, Don, you and Bert could force those two back to the back of the pen. Mary Jane Schramm has been a volunteer for over seven years. The animals that we admit at the Marine Mammal Center are here for one purpose and one purpose only. They come in critically ill. We are here to rehabilitate them, to release them back to the wild again. That is our sole objective. So the fluid should go pretty quickly. Okay. Mary Jane Schramm is one of over 400 volunteers at the center. Together, they donate thousands of hours tending to sick and injured mammals. Trained by professionals, they have learned how to save lives. Formerly a Nike missile base, the center was founded in 1975 on land loaned by the government. Um, art! This hospital, like all hospitals, is the scene of continuous drama. down and we're going to have to get it out. <laughs> Quickly, the team removes a piece of wire that was lodged in the animal's mouth. We see animals that come in here for the most part with natural problems. But when we admit an animal that's been shot or hit by a propeller or in some cases deliberately injured by people, it's, it's really hard to take that. Some animals are too sick for help. Moonbeam has been here just one day. Suffering from a bacterial disease, his kidneys have failed and he has died. Mary Jane draws blood for analysis. Even in death, much can be learned. When an animal dies and you've been doing all you can to help it, it can be very hurtful and very frustrating. But if you gave in to yourself and really grieved for every animal, then that would take away from what you could give to the surviving animals that require your care. But for every death, there are also many successes. Most of the animals now at the center will be returned to the wild. Those who don't fully recover will be sent to aquariums or oceanariums, where they'll continue to play an important role in educating the public. Just a few months ago, Satchmo suffered severe seizures brought on by pneumonia. Today, at a healthy 484 pounds, he is conditioned for his release. Don't do it. He's in. Okay, but you think no that problem. you can do yeah, that? He, he He's fed only through the cage that will eventually carry him to freedom. 
Perhaps he'll be more willing to enter it on the day of his release. The center's massive rehabilitation effort is financed entirely by memberships and donations. Wednesday, I thought he was going to be able to go Saturday. What, what Pagin Barrett is the executive director. The volunteers at the California Marine Mammal Center come from all walks of life. We have carpenters and lawyers and housewives and doctors. It's hard work. It means coming at 6.30 in the morning and pulling apart frozen fish and then maybe an hour later jumping on a 400-pound sea lion to give him medication. And these volunteers are, I think, a tremendous example that it is possible to do an effort like this and to really enrich your life. Most tasks are shared, yet in a lonely corner of the compound sits Joe Mayberry. He's the only one who regularly volunteers for this duty. I'm the poop sleuth here, and uh, you're the first visitors I've had all day, so... Uh... <laughs> but Joe Mayberry knows that looking for parasites in fecal samples is serious business. Because the parasites can absolutely kill them, and, uh, you know, I feel almost like a scientist. <laughs> This important work is yielding much needed data that will be shared throughout the scientific community. And as the volunteers and professionals work to better understand these magnificent creatures and their world, they're also learning something about their own. Marine mammals are a living litmus test of the health of our oceans. They eat what we eat. So they are a very good parallel in terms of judging not what we're doing to quote, the environment, what we do, we do to ourselves, ultimately. The animals that you see in this particular pen are northern elephant seal pups. For and the more than 50,000 visitors who come here each year, the working hospital leaves a lasting impression, an understanding of the importance of these creatures in the wild, and an appreciation of the efforts of those who work here. times where we've been charged, and I actually had one animal charged so hard that he broke my herding board. They're dangerous animals to work with because they're wild. But these are all elements that are essential to their recovery. At the end of every successful recovery is what these volunteers call graduation day. The animals are weighed and secured for their two hour trip up the California coast to the release site. On a remote strip of beach, there is much anticipation from both volunteers and animals. No more free lunches from now on in your <laughs> Eleuthera, Tyler, Crane, Frederica, and Speedy join the hundreds of other animals that have been returned to the wild by these volunteers. They become individual animals to us. But the right thing to do is to give them back their freedom. There's just a, a tremendous reward in doing that. Now it's time for the big guy, Satchmo. After a routine of three meals a day and around-the-clock attention, he's not so sure he wants to go. Just a century ago, these mammals were pursued for their oil and fur. Some species were nearly wiped out. There are fish out there. Today, because of strict federal laws and heightened public awareness resulting from the efforts of individuals like these, some balance has been restored. All right, don't forget to write. No, don't come back. Satchmo enters an uncertain world, a world increasingly dependent upon people to protect it. The challenge to preserve America's coastal resources is immense. But here and there, east, west, north, and south, individual Americans are answering the call. We deserve to be there, and we can make it. In North Carolina, Lena Ritter continues to fight for clean water and the heritage of her people. 
At Oregon Inlet, scientists, fishermen, and planners work to understand their coast and each other. In Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, the Chesapeake Bay kids keep spreading the word we all live downstream. And in Texas, thousands of people are joining together to help raise an awareness that might free our oceans from debris. They're inspired by Tony Amos and his love for wildlife. Everywhere, the message is clear. To conserve our coastal resource is to conserve America.